we won't be having cuts in those. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at doing things in a different way. And as a part of that process, something that continues to come up, and I know is a topic in our November session of the Riverton Advisory Council, is this idea of fees. There are a number of districts around and some neighboring us that have much higher fees than what we currently charge. And, and so that's an idea of coming out. Oh, excuse me, I'm having fun with the change from warm weather to cold. My sinuses never want to cooperate. But looking at this idea, for example, driver education. Uh, Williamsville and Rochester both uh, charge the maximum amount for that under statute, which is $250. Is that something we start to consider? Because that's a very expensive program, and currently we're, we're offering that program at $50 a student. Again, it'd be nice to be able to do that, but our financial picture doesn't really indicate that that is maybe the wisest thing that we can do. Along with that idea, when I talk with folks in the community, There, there is some support for that, but there's also this idea of, okay, we have 53% of our students that are on free and reduced lunch. And the idea of, if you don't have the ability to pay for something that might be an extracurricular, is there a way through volunteering that you can give some back to the district? For example, we pay right now um, for ticket takers to a lot of our winter sports. And the idea of, you know, if I don't have the ability to pay for my daughter Abigail's uh, extracurricular in the musical, can I cover four basketball games as a ticket taker and I save that much money and it covers the fee? These are all things that we're starting to explore in this process. And again, just in, in my words, and I don't want to necessarily speak for the board on this, but in my words as superintendent, it's important for everybody to have some skin in the game. So those are things that we're looking at in that area. Next slide, please. So what's next for us as we move forward into the end of this year and then looking ahead into next year? We really need to address our infrastructure problem. It's, it's coming to a point, the state has said they're not gonna support landlines anymore. That's a big part of our process. We're still on analog phones. Uh, also, we need to address that expectation piece. It was ironic, and maybe not, maybe not to everybody here, but how prevalent that was is, as we had a number, uh, just about 40 members of the community and the board and administration meet on Saturday to start this process of looking at strategic goals and prioritizing what's important and the needs of the district. And that expectations piece was huge. Increasing the expectation. Now, realistically, that doesn't mean every single child at Riverton is going to take all of these advanced placement classes that we're going to look at in the future. Very realistically, on that process to advanced placement, there will be dual credit options. And based on a student's plan, and based on what they may want to do up on the next step, there may be some dual credit pieces that go in. But we need to have that rigor in place so every student has the ability to exercise those options they're not stuck because of where they are. Also, this idea of advanced placement, marketing that, I have an area superintendent that has asked me about how that curriculum will look and how that will play out in our process. And so we're looking at right now setting up an arrangement where students from other districts can come in and pay a very small tuition amount, which would be similar to if they took a community college class like at Lincoln Land or something. And take, to, and take these AP classes with our students and earn a little bit of tuition that way. Another item that we're looking at is we currently have an after school program at the elementary and I think it also pulls over some fifth graders that the YMCA offers for us. And we believe that we can make some revenue on that um, and also have a little bit different, not so much solely and, and I don't mean to give them a hard time, but in my perception of trying to explain this, like an afternoon recess. And, and again, making it more educational, even with a physical component included in that every day. So that's another item we're considering. And then again, what resources can we tap into? 
Where can we find things? We've been, again, very blessed with this opportunity to work in technology with one of the best districts in Illinois at no cost. We are partnering this second semester with Millican University and we have students that are going to be doing some research on how can we communicate more effectively with parents at no cost. Those are, are there partnerships that we can develop like you might see at the college level, like you might see uh, in the corporate world to again try to garner some resources for the school. Next slide. Okay, audience participation time. Who has questions based on our update so far uh, partway through the school year? Yes? With the free and reduced um, after school, an after school program, how will that affect free and reduced? That's a good question. Specifics I don't have for you right now. One of those items would be, okay, we're going to offer that for folks um, who will pay the after school hour. That's, that's one way to go. The other idea is, do we open a certain number of slots for free and reduced under the idea of, is there a community group, a church, or something like that that might support a person's tuition? Those are things we'd have to look at. We, again, like, if we would take that program on, we would have to consider in this idea of trying to enhance our revenues. We can't have half or 53% of the children in that program not pay for that and be able to offer anything for any extended amount of time. So but I, to answer Tracy's question, I don't have an answer for that yet, but that's part of what we'd have to explore if we go in that direction. Now, to be honest with you, again, I would favor some kind of a pay-in or somebody sponsoring that child as opposed to just for free. Because, again, you're, when you have a little bit invested in that as a parent, as a student, it becomes much more important to you than, or to me. If I'm not paying for something, I might be a lot harder on that piece of equipment than if I've got to pay to fix it. Anything else? Yes? Is there currently revenue from that just goes right to the YMCA. But the school doesn't benefit Not financially. So again, these are some of these items that we're looking at. Is, is that something we can benefit from financially while offering a better possible program for the students? Other questions? Yes? When you're talking about classes versus dual credit. When our girls were in high school, the AP really did nothing for them. Sorry, I don't know if everybody can hear. Talking about AP classes versus dual credit, I understand that you have to have, the, the teachers have to have the masters in that area of study in order to do dual credit. Yes. But our experience and our kids' friends' experience, the AP classes very few of them ever tested out in order to get the college credit, and if they did, they their scores came so late in the process that they never knew what to sign up for for the college classes. So why are we looking at more AP versus dual credit? Good question. That's, we raise the money that's, that's a great question. That's a, and that's one perspective. If you take the dual credit, you get for sure in Illinois. It, once you go out of the state, it becomes much less clear. But for sure in Illinois, I take this English, English class with Todd. He's got his master's, and I score in it. I believe it's a C or higher. I have the credit. There's a financial piece with that. Now, part of the challenge, in my perspective, in the past is we tried to do a couple of things at once. We had some honors. We had some AP trying to roll together. And the rigor may not have been where it needs to be. And what I would share with you from a number of years of experience as a principal is the rigor is different. If you're looking at the four-year college route, and if you're looking at you want to be challenged the best you can to be prepared for that level, that AP is there. And, and Mrs. Cleavy is exactly correct. You have to have a certain score for that to benefit you financially. Now, I've had a lot of situations where I would have students come back that would have a two. They didn't get the minimum three. And now with the economics, Real, realistically, colleges are wanting a score of four or higher so they don't have to you know, give you that rebate on the tuition. 
However, those kids that would come back from taking those classes were prepared. They were the ones that said, gosh, I'm glad that you made me go through this class and take it when they sat in some of those freshman courses because of the rigor. And, 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 that's, and that's based on two different experiences, Carl Sandburg College in the Galesburg area and the Heartland Community College in the Bloomington area. Now I'm here just starting to work with Lincoln Land Community College. But I think there are different, again, different expectations. What is important to your child and what's their plan? And I think that's why we have to have both. But there, if, what I would share with you as a superintendent and why am I putting my overall eggs in the AP basket? Because if you set your standard at dual credit and that's the highest, our kids generally, as an entire group, aren't going to be prepared like we want them to be when they leave here and when you're footing the bill for that tuition. Now, if they're going that direction and they get to that last couple years of high school and they, they're like, look, for these reasons, I want to take dual credit, that'll be great. They will be prepared because, again, of that level of rigor that we're trying to vertically align with that AP piece. Um, and that's a very fair point to point out for everybody. Yes? That's a good question. If, where we're set up right now with these financial pieces and our component of that that we have in place is that you have to pay the tuition part. We still have teachers working on that master's credential and that dual credit will still be an option. Now what I will do, again as the superintendent, it's not really exactly my place other than we really need to have an AP presence and a dual credit presence. It would really be the high school principal's place to say but it would make sense. They need to not compete. So if we have an AP class in a certain level of history, we don't want to have dual credit in the exact same area. We would want to have that psychology or something against so they're not competing against each other. And, and yes, there is some overlap in kids that take both. Other questions? And feel free to throw anything out there. We'll try to answer whatever we can tonight. Is that continuing to put us in the position where we have to follow the Common Core requirements? Is that part of that? No, that really, that would be an argument, on, in, in, in all fairness, that would be an argument not to follow the Common Core. Now, that's a very dangerous line of thinking, and I don't want to try and throw that out and suggest that to you completely, but if they're not paying, why are we doing this? Right. What I, what I can say that I have really appreciated about our Board of Education is in this process, as I say, here are pieces that I like, personally and professionally. I, there are a lot of components of the nonfiction, listening, reading, speaking, writing, and the English that I think are very solid. And you can tie that into Illinois Teachers of English. Math is a different story. It's challenging what they're trying to do. There are some developmental issues that I have. But again, that's why you look at, okay, that's one piece. We've got an advanced placement piece. We're also looking at what the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics do. One of the big components with the next generation science is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That is huge everywhere right now. So we're taking all those components and looking at that so that it's not only one we're not putting all our bags only in one basket for the next person to possibly get elected and then we change it a little bit, so on and so forth. But there are good pieces in that, and so those good pieces we're pulling out. You have, a, you have a very solid instructional staff in this district. I've been very impressed. I will offer to you publicly that I think K-12, this is the best faculty I've ever worked with, and I've worked with some solid faculties that have won awards. And so their piece in this process, that's why we're going through the alignment. We have a district curriculum team that is examining these things and then going back to their buildings and duking it out to some extent, 
grade to grade, teacher to teacher, and all the first grade or all the eighth grade to examine what they also know about best practice. So that's, that's a big component to this because this is what's important for us, and your board sees this. What's important for us is to have a solid academic program based on sound instruction that provides good formative feedback to parents and students along the way. Because whatever your test is, AP, ACT, the math test, when you do that well, those assessments take care of themselves. That's a, that's a great point. Yes? Um, you talk about technology and the iPads for the K through to second grade, but there was no mention of third through twelfth grade and where we're going and infrastructure. That's great. Absolutely. We're not going anywhere right now, third through twelfth grade. We have the ability at that elementary school to support those, and we have the ability to get the grant funding where it didn't cost the taxpayer anything for that. We're able to support it. We're able to get these things, image they're putting it together right now. We, and, and everything for our district comes into that elementary school. That's the focal point. That, that T1 cabling comes in there and it branches out from there. So arguably the technology in that building, the infrastructure, excuse me, the infrastructure in that building, while it needs work, is a little bit better than the others. So we have to address those pieces to move forward, which is why this is a huge priority for second semester. But what we are looking at is a Samsung, I believe, 2 version of the Chromebook as you start to move beyond third grade and on, well, arguably up through high school. Kids need to have different technological experiences in their school, but it needs to be based on, again, what instructionally do we know that kids need to produce? What is the best tool for that? And I don't know about you folks, but the last thing I want to do is try to create a paper or something like this on a tablet. But when they're younger and they understand that app piece and everybody has an app on their phone, everybody, regardless of where your income is, and kids understand that and they can deal with that, so that's where we're trying to connect at that lower level with that, that interactive tablet technology. So again, this is this idea that we're trying to have the bigger picture first and filter it down. But that's a great point because, hey, I've had all this great stuff in second grade, and now what happens? But these Chromebooks that you speak of, would this be a parent purchasing <coughs> and not the district purchasing Chromebooks? Well, what, it wouldn't be the parent most likely purchasing the Chromebook, but what I would be looking at recommending to the board is if we have some kind of fee, that we have a fee all over the place instead of, well, only the kindergarten and first and second grade people are paying. Or only if, if we're using that technology, again, to try to continue to infuse money into technology, I would likely recommend some type of a fee as part of your books. Because we, we really need to look at the idea of, ideally, and again, I'm not sure we're in an ideal situation, uh, when, when we talk as a board and as superintendent. But ideally, with the way the technology becomes outdated so quick, we would, and the abuse and abuse that just happens when you're, everything's heavy duty when you work through it in schools, we would want to be on a rotation of third, a third, a third. So the elementary, we would work on updating those machines, let's say the middle school the following year, the high school the year after that. Then by that time, we would have needs again at that elementary level. And they're, Rochester, those folks, all of the students were required to purchase a Chromebook. It was not at the school's expense, it was at the student's expense. And I, I mean, we, we have great financial issues. Why can't we do something like that? Why can't children or parents provide technology for their students to bring to school? Well, and, and that would be well, my answer. Those people that don't play that, that couldn't afford it in Rochester, they work on whiteboards. And, and those are, again, these are all important parts of this discussion because, in all fairness to our teachers, there's enough challenges with differentiating right now without introducing different levels of technology that somehow we can't have this discrepancy or this gap grow even wider. 
but that, that's the reality. How do we address this because of that large population we have that does not have those resources? And again, so we have a bring your own device policy right now where your student, if you have this technology, could go to their principal and get a form and there's a way you can sign off, the kid signs off and we sign off through the administration at your building that you can bring some of your own devices. And, and those are things we're continuing to explore in this process. But, but again, to share that idea, where would we go as a district? These are the things that we're discussing and these are the technologies we would recommend based on what we see in this overall technological plan and what we see the kids need instructionally. The hard thing, I don't disagree again, it's this idea of 